Hey everyone, my name is Eric Thor and today we are talking about the 8 function model. And the 8 function model was developed to understanding Carl Jung's 8 cognitive functions. And it was an attempt by Jon Beebe to study how each cognitive function works for each of the 16 personality types. So what he did was he basically assigned each cognitive function to a specific position, the dominant, auxiliary, tertiary, inferior, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth cognitive function. And he said these are rated in the order of consciousness. So the higher up in the stack, the more conscious and the more aware we are when we use it. Now, I'd like to say that actually consciousness is a variable and it depends from person to person. Don't stare yourself blind at how much you use a cognitive function because you can use any cognitive function. Rather, understand the impact that each cognitive function will have on your mental health and well-being. When you use it, what happens when you use the cognitive functions? Find out that and more in today's video. The first thing I want you to understand is that the dominant function is the function that you use four dimensionally. That means it gives you energy, it gives you stability, it gives you motivation, and it gives you confidence. The more you use this cognitive function, the more confident you become. The more clear, the more strong, the more conscious this function is in your stack, the better you feel. It's your flow function and it gives you a sense of agency. When you have this function, you feel in control of this function, you feel that you are an agent, an active agent, proactive, in charge of your own life, making your own decisions. When you don't have this function, you feel like you are weak, you feel like you're not strong enough, you feel like you're not sure what you're doing, you feel doubt, you feel turbulent, you feel a lack of motivation, you have a lack of energy, and you have a lack of confidence. So assertive types, People that got an A on their 16 personalities test or people with low neuroticism in the big five, they are people that tend to have a very strong dominant function. <laughs> the thing about the dominant function is people with a strong dominant function, they tend to be dominant. That means, yeah, they tend to be decisive, they tend to be pushy about what they want, they don't back down easily, they set boundaries for themselves, they talk about what they want and they put a lot of hours into what they want and they don't change their course of action easily. They want to keep using their function as much as possible. The auxiliary function serves the role of your mentor. Harry Merle from Cognitive Personality Theory calls it the authority function, and I kind of like that word. The way I see it is it's your positive authority figure. It's your benchmark, what you measure yourself against. It's your goals. It's your long-term ambitions, what you want what you're working towards you know typically it's like the modus operandi of every personality type it's why they do what they do they say yeah i engage in the dominant function and i do all these things because i want to and there comes the motivation the second function help the people or <laughs> realize my ambitions or improve myself or whatever your cognitive function is <laughs> the thing about the mentor is it's constantly annoying <laughs> what that means is it's kind of like that angel on your shoulder that tells you what you should be doing you know you should be nice to that person you should be helping that person you should be standing up for yourself you should be telling them what you really think you know it's that voice in your shoulder that says you know that tells you your morals or tells you the rules or tells you the standards that you need to live up to what you need to be doing the thing about the authority or mentor is that it feels a little bit out of our control. We, are, we know it's the right thing to do, but we don't know how. How do I speak the truth? What is the truth? How do I do the right thing? What is the right thing to do? And the thing is, and here's the thing that's really interesting. The tertiary function is a lot stronger than what people think. I call the tertiary function the sidekick or the hobby function. We use it a lot. We use it more than we use the auxiliary function. And it has a lot less rules to it. It's easy. It gives relief from all those expectations of the second function. The second function is always going like, you can do better than that. The tertiary function is like, you're good enough the way you are. <laughs> the tertiary function is like, um, 
cons that that thing you do to get escape like that thing you do well that thing you specialized on that you feel that you know the back inside the back of your own head you know the familiar and easy thing the tertiary function is easy it's not necessarily actually fun it's just easy it's an easy way to get relief when life is too much so people tend to go into that dreaded MITI loop or dominant tertiary loop, whatever type they are, now because they seek relief, they want to have an easy life, they don't want to have all these expectations, they don't want to measure themselves up to these standards, they want things to be simple. And so that's what happens. And that simple life that keeps them from growing, that keeps them from improving themselves, that keeps them from listening to their mentor, they lose touch with their role model they lose touch with their standards and you know they start feeling worse about themselves for it you know they have this anxiety they know that they are kind of wasting their life doing something frivolous they know that they're kind of stuck in a rut they know they're an R pilot but they don't know if they can succeed the fourth function we should talk about is the inferior function and the inferior function is interesting because it serves as your core weakness in life, a constant struggle. It's a constant wrestling match between your dominant and your inferior function. But I call the inferior function the protector. It keeps you safe from stress and worries. Whenever you feel stressed or worried about something, you go into the inferior function. That's going to fix everything. You know, if I just improve at this skill, if I just fix or make up for this weakness that I have, my life is going to get better. So. We use and engage in this function to protect ourselves from danger. You know, the flow function, the hero, the protagonist, the dominant function, it does what it enjoys, you know, it does what it enjoys passionately, and it wants to keep doing that. The inferior function says, you have responsibilities, you have duties, you have expectations, you have people that need you, you know, like you have things that are required of you to be a healthy functioning human, so you need to do this. <laughs> and it's kind of a forceful master, you know, it's um, in that sense, you know it's an important and necessary thing and you do it so that you can kind of present a good image to the world. The truth is people use this function quite a lot, especially today. In today's society, we're all supposed to be perfect. We're not supposed to have any weaknesses. We have to fix and hide all our issues, you know, you go to a job interview and everything you say has to be positive. You're not allowed to have weaknesses or flaws. You have to be great. Of course, nobody is. It's a nice lie. It's a nice deception because no matter how much you work at your flaws, you're always going to have things that you struggle with. You're always going to, it's never going to be perfect. And you can slave away and do these things and indefinitely work on these things. But if you do it too much, you're going to find that you're not having fun. You're not enjoying life. You're not living the dream that you want. You're not doing the things that are important to you. You're not allowing yourself to have that flow state. Ultimately, you have to decide to live for yourself, to do the thing that you care about the most. So you have to take a risk and you have to do the dangerous thing. You have to pursue your flow state. And of course, there is a degree to which you need to use the inferior function. Uh, but it shouldn't be taking over your life. It should be a small thing that you do as little as possible, but only when necessary, but definitely when necessary. We tend to say that the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth function, they're unconscious. They don't exist. We don't have them. They don't, they, they never happen. No, no, never. The thing is we do use them. We use all eight cognitive functions. How do we use them though? Well, what I found is the fifth function is the muse. It's the inspirational function. It's kind of, uh, if your dominant function is the engine, the gas pedal that goes true, like, okay, if that's what drives you forward in life, if that's what gives you agency. Uh, oh my God, what a terrible impression. Uh, the fifth function is the gas tank. And you know, have you ever noticed there's like times in your life that you want to have flow, you want to push forward, you want to go forward in life and improve and push your dominant function forward in life, but you can't, you have no energy, you have no motivation, you have no inspiration, you don't know where to start. Well, it's because you're missing the fifth function. 
The fifth function is difficult because you can't use it yourself, but you can experience it. You can access it from other people and from the world around you. Turns out perhaps you're a bit stuck in your own head. Perhaps you're a bit lost, a bit stuck in your own script. You're doing your own things and following your own task list, but sometimes we need to be vulnerable. And the fifth function rewards vulnerability. Put yourself out there, ask for help, go and learn something new, go outside your comfort zone, do something unexpected or follow somebody else or listen to somebody inspiring. The inspirational function fills you with energy, fills up your tank. And after you've been engaging with this function, you'll find you have a lot more energy and a lot more drive. You'll have the push to make your dominant function thrive. Flow needs a constant source and access to a source and access to fuel and motivation. So you need to feed your fire. You can't just burn. You have to feed your fire. You have to keep investing in and making sure that you get energy and motivation to make it work. So what do you need? Well, to know what you need, check what your fifth function is. The sixth function is another one that is a lot stronger than people think. In socionics, it's often equated to be of equal strength to the first one. You can use it almost as well as the first one. However, the sixth function is usually a person's concept of heaven. The sixth function is your utopia, you know, your dream state. You know, if you have a concept of your dream life, you know, the ultimate life for you or like the best thing ever that you are constantly working to reach, you know, that's the, usually the sixth function. People are always working towards, you know, with the hope of coming to heaven or with the hope of being rewarded. And the ultimate reward for anyone is the sixth function. If you want to think about how to make a person feel truly loved, or if you want to give the person an, the ultimate gift, give them the sixth function, Fi figure out what their sixth function is and give them the chance to have that and to experience that function. Typically, it's the ultimate source of meaningful relief. It's unlike the third function, which is mostly an escape, like something you do to get out or get away from things. The sixth function feels like an ultimate reward. And that's also a thing. A lot of people are not ready to receive or accept the sixth function or not ready to accept love. Uh, because they don't feel they are worthy of it. They believe that they have to be worthy of the sixth function to experience it. They believe that they have to deserve it and have to have done something great to show for it. So <laughs> the question is, do you feel that you deserve to experience this? And is this, what is your ideal and what is it you want and what do you need to do to experience that and to allow yourself to feel that? We have to open ourselves up to it, just like we have to make ourselves vulnerable for the fifth function. We have to allow ourselves to be loved to experience the sixth function. The seventh function is an interesting one. It's sometimes called the trickster. To me, it's the aggressive function. It's what we use to push and move boundaries or to protect our own boundaries. It's how we push ourselves. What I see is people usually use the seventh function as their whip. So it's that kind of master that goes faster harder better stronger you have you you, you could do better than that it's your inner drill sergeant so it's really the function that uh, serves as the um, negative motivator uh, and you know it can also be used in conflict so if we get upset or if we feel that other people have mistreated us or if we feel that things are wrong we'll usually go to the seventh function to protect ourselves and to stand up for ourselves so it's that desire to you know you know like uh, uh, give reve get revenge if you feel mistreated or to do something to get justice or it's your source of judgment the seventh function is very much your sense of judgment to, of this this is not right this should not happen and i have to say something and i have to do something about it however the seventh function can also be your lack of judgment <laughs> so it can be the things you do in the heat of the moment because you were upset or angry or afraid uh, to just get rid of the situation or to avoid it. It can be, you know, like the tendency to run away from problems or to choose the easy path or to hide away or to ignore something. And that's why sometimes it's called a trickster because a lot of the time it tricks us to doing what we don't want to do, what we know is wrong. And so 
we have to think about how we relate to this function, how we use it, what is the right time. Some people like Jordan Peterson say that we should know that we are capable of doing great harm and committing great evil. We should be aware of the seven function. We should know that we can and be capable of being highly aggressive and volatile. And we should choose not to be like that. We should know that we can. Yes, this is an option. It's possible. If I'm cornered, if things are at my very worst, I could do this. I could, this could happen. But I'm going to set a positive example. I'm going to do the right thing. That's the goal for the seven function. The eight function is kind of our inner manager. It's that thing that says what we need to do. It's kind of like that voice in our head that goes like, these are your duties and chores, and these are your responsibilities, and these are the things you need to be doing. You know, it's the opposite of flow, it's the autopilot. The eight function represents the autopilot, the automatic chores, tasks, and things that you do without thinking, without any conscious thought. Uh, when we run through the eight function, we can be in the grip of the eight function. We can be stuck in a state of autopilot, just doing things that we know are important, but that we couldn't give a crap about. So the eight function has a very unique relationship to the first function, the flow function. When, you, when things become too easy and comfortable, and when things lose their curiosity or interest or motivational factor, we go into autopilot. So every task that you know in life that you consider to be boring goes under and it is done through the use of the eight function. Especially tasks that are easy. If a task is difficult, it's the fourth function. But if a task is easy and you've done it a million times and you hate it and it's boring, you do it with the eight function. And uh, the thing with autopilot is we often lose conscious thought when we do it. It's, we become like zombies, automatons. We're just moving, acting reactively, doing what we've already done a million times in a really simple way. And we don't even know that we're in autopilot. Most people that are in autopilot are asleep and don't even realize that they're dreaming. And so it can be very hard to break out of because how do you know that you are conscious? How do you know that you're awake? How do you know that you're alive? Well, chances are if you're listening to these videos and thinking about that, you are alive, you are thinking, you are conscious and you're paying attention to your life and you're thinking about what you want and you're trying to make a difference for yourself and you're trying to become more conscious. So good on you you're starting to break out of the autopilot and you're starting to challenge yourself. Now keep going. There are a couple of tips I want to mention when developing your cognitive functions because you want to move towards developing primarily your dominant function and your auxiliary function. You want to learn to use these functions as well as possible. But how do you do that? Well, first thing I want you to think about is developing your own assertiveness. Being assertive doesn't mean that you're not afraid of making mistakes. Certainly, you can make mistakes, you can make mess up with things, you can do bad things, you can fail, you can struggle, things can go wrong. It's possible, it's going to happen <laughs> um, many times in your life. But what really helps a person, you know, is a dose of humor. What I've found is that everyone that has a strong grasp of their auxiliary function tend to have a strong grasp of their humor. What helps you deal with the mentor? What helps you have high expectations on yourself? What helps you manage expectations and pressure and demands and moral things? Well, it's a sense of humor. It's having strong values and balancing that with the ability to joke and laugh if you mess up and to be human. Having humor means accepting that you are human, accepting that, yeah, you'll do stupid things. You're not always going to be great. You're not always going to be perfect. And having humor makes it a lot easier to navigate the second function. People with a strong sense of humor can set bigger goals and can be more consistent in their goals because if they fail, they'll laugh about it. They'll make a joke out of it and then they'll keep going because, yeah, I, I failed. So what? I can do better. I can get further. I can go even more. So the healthy dose of humor is important because it helps you stay afloat. People that are too serious and too critical of themselves will be shooting themselves down. They'll try to set high goals with the auxiliary. And if they fail or if things are not right, they'll be so defeatist, so prone to self-sabotage, so self-critical that they will kill their own motivation. I suck, I'm terrible, there's no point. 
I missed, I messed up, I did a mistake, it's irreparable, it's irredeemable, I can never do anything to make up for it. You know, that kind of monologue, you're too serious, you're too tense, you need to lighten up, you need to be able to brush it off, you need to be able to laugh in the face of pain and to know that you can go further and to know that it will be okay. The other thing when it comes to developing assertiveness and uh, becoming more dominant is learning where to direct your sense of control. You can't control other people, you can't control what other people do, but you can be your own master. Learning to put control in the right direction is key to being assertive. Typically what I see with turbulent people is they put all their control on other people. That means they are only good, they're only confident if they're able to have control over their environment and over other people and over other factors. But control has to come from inside, it has to come from yourself. So you have to first focus on being your own master. That's the only thing you can ever realistically hope to control. Everyone else is going to be chaos. Everyone else is going to be random factors, variables that you can never predict. So you have to focus your control on the things that you can control. People that are turbulent do exhibit control and do try to control things, but often they try to control things they will never have control over. They'll constantly worry or obsess about things that are beyond their ability, beyond their capabilities, beyond their power, and they'll forget to invest power and control into things that do matter. So what matters? What is important to you? And where do you have power and influence? Focus your energy on that. I wish you the best of luck in developing all the eight functions and what you want to have ideally is a healthy relationship to every single function. You shouldn't have a function that you hate or avoid or demonize. No function is evil. Every function is important. You can use the autopilot to do things that you need to do, but hate doing. You can use your auxiliary function to set goals. Every function matters. And which function matters the most to you?